Good morning. Welcome to the East Canton Church of God. Um, just a reminder, you have some welcome cards in your pew pockets. Uh, we love to communicate back and forth. That's just one way. Uh, you can also always stop in the church office, email. Uh, you can do your tithes and offerings online. You continue your worship uh, on the way out by doing tithes and offerings. So lots of ways for us to connect. Uh, don't forget that. If you have any changes in your contact information, make sure that we know. We would love to connect with you. I have just a few announcements. One of those is tomorrow we have the parade. The parade starts at 10. The lineup is at 930. This is for anyone who can come and be a part of the parade. And the reason why we walk as a church is so that we can hand out information for VBS, for sports and arts camp. So we want to make sure our community knows about that, and we are able to invite our kids from the community into our sports and arts camp. So if you're able to uh, walk and come, uh, and I know uh, Pamela and Doug Deal are heading that project up, so if you have questions, you can ask them. Otherwise, show up at 930, and we'll get lined up. Next Sunday, June 2nd, we have a business meeting, um, and there is a, a sheet that's available that gives you a little bit of information on this business meeting, um, but just as a heads up, the property next to the church has come up for sale, and so we have an opportunity, and we need to sort through that as a congregation, uh, and so, you know, please, please stay after the service next Sunday. Um, just for a, a, a short time so that we can work through that. On June 1st, our high school and our middle school are going to gather. So at 6 p.m., uh, details will be coming. But if you have a high school or middle school youth, uh, please send them our direction. We're going to gather June 1st and have some fun. The discipleship nights on Wednesdays are done for now. But we're moving to a summer schedule, so uh, more details will be coming. Um, enjoy this Wednesday, have some time off, uh, and we will be, like the men are going to meet every other week, things like that, or, or several weeks throughout the summer. So those details will be coming, but for now, uh, enjoy as we step into summer. And then just a couple celebrations. Uh, we had a few weeks ago, we had a state champion, that's Bryce Fuller. Hey, Bryce, wave. <laughs> so he was the middle school champion for the mile run. Pretty awesome. And now we have fast legs for Luke, so we'll celebrate him when he gets back. If you will um, join me in prayer. Heavenly Father, we just thank you that we can come together, that we can gather, that we can um, celebrate you, we can learn about your word and this love letter that you have left for us. And we just pray that as we dive into your word today, you will just open our hearts, that we can hear your word, we can um, bring it into our hearts and hide it in our hearts, uh, that we have understanding and that you just guide us. Um, we just pray that you will bless the message this morning and that you will guide our steps to apply it to our lives as we move into this Memorial Day week uh, and that you will allow us to be the light that is in your world. And we just pray this in your name, Jesus. Amen. Amen. If you'll stand and greet each other.
come together this morning thanking God for everything that he's done for us this week. Just continue with us as we worship and praise today. Amen. Just reading in the Bible this morning, 1 Timothy, it's so cool. There's no confusion. There's one God and one mediator between God and man. Who would that be? The man, Christ Jesus. Do you know him? This is our God. Amen. Remember those walls that we called sin and shame. They were like prisons that we couldn't escape. But he came and he died and he rose those walls above. Giants we call death and grave. They were like mountains that stood in our way. And he came and he died and he rose. Those giants are dead. Yes. This is our God. This is who he is. He loves us. This is our God. This is what he does. He saves us. He bore the cross, beat the grave. Let heaven and earth proclaim. This is our God, King Jesus. Remember the fear that took our breath away. Faith so weak that we could bear. grateful. We're grateful we can stand before you and clap our hands and sing songs and praise you in the good. And we praise you that we can also sing songs sometimes that are not 
as joyful. Maybe they're a little hard, maybe a little confusing. We praise you that you are the author and perfecter of our faith and that we can do all things through you. And we just love you, Lord Jesus. Please be with us as we finish this service. Anoint the words, anoint the worship, and just be with us as we go into celebrate and mourn, say goodbye, or maybe even just sing some more praise to you. It's in your glorious name we pray. Amen.
Good morning. Larry mentioned about the scripture readings this morning. He read from 1 Timothy. And our psalm reading was from Psalm 99. It says, The Lord reigns. Let the peoples tremble. He sits enthroned upon the cherubim. Let the earth quake. The Lord is great in Zion. He is exalted above all the peoples. Let them praise your great and awesome name, for he is holy. The king in his might loves justice. You have established equity. You have executed justice and righteousness in Jacob. Exalt the Lord our God. Worship at his footstool. He is holy. Our Lord, our God, you answered them. You were forgiving a forgiving God to them, but an avenger of their wrongdoings. Exalt the Lord, our God, and worship at his holy mountain. For the Lord, our God, is holy. Amen. Heavenly Father, we come before you. You are holy. You are righteous. You are the King of kings and the Lord of lords, and you sit on the throne, and we worship you and praise you. We thank you for your mighty works that you have done, how you created this earth, the universe, everything that is in it. You created the skies and the seas, and you created us, and we praise you. You are a wonderful God. You saw us in our desperate need of a savior and you sent your son Jesus Christ to this earth to be a sacrifice to shed his blood on a cross that we might have forgiveness of sins and we praise you for that we thank you Heavenly Father that he did not stay in the grave but that on the third day he arose from the dead and it was seen by many people and he went around the earth and was uh, the countryside and was talking with the people and then he ascended into heaven and he sits right now at your right hand with all authority given to him in heaven and the earth and we praise you and thank you we thank you that through him we can receive salvation that we have the hope of the glory that we can be with you in heaven at the end of our lives or when you return, whichever comes first. We just praise you and thank you, Father, that you love us and that you are not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. And so we know that, Lord, as we sit here this morning, each one of us comes in various places and various parts of our journey. Some just beginning the journey with you, and some of us have been at this journey for a while. And yet we all recognize that we need you. We can do nothing without you. And so, Father, we come before you and we ask you to hear our prayers. We thank you, Father, for the, the, the time that we are celebrating right now, this Memorial Day, as we celebrate the fact that so many men and women gave their life so that we could be here this morning in this place and worshiping you in freedom. We thank you, Father, for their sacrifice that they made on our behalf. And then, Father God, we thank you for this country that we do live in. We thank you, Father, that you are, have given us freedom. We pray, Heavenly Father, that you would, from your place on high, Speak to the hearts of the people who are in leadership in our country, the governors, the senators, the representatives, our president, the Supreme Court, and even down to our city councils, Father. We ask that you would work in their hearts, that you would draw them and woo them to be close to you, that they would read your word and they would govern according to your ways. We ask that in Jesus' powerful name. 
And then as we come before you, Lord, there are so many people that are on our prayer list, and we ask for your divine intervention in their lives. We think of Adriana Stewart, Steve Hill, Mario Snellenberger, Kathy Phillips, Kim Swanger, Joanne Schroyer, Lois Baker, Jennings Tolman, Gary Odie, Eladio Santiago, Mel Melody Kettering, Jessica Williams, Catherine Floto, Becky Du Bois, Sharon Madison, John Crope McCroby, Matt and Sarah and Jack Holm, Jerry Clapper, Melissa Mercy, Mercer, Terry Moore, Debbie Tallman, Lee Crone, John Crisp, Karen Gill, Bonnie Mayo, Cheryl Jones, Carmen Moore, Howard Deal, Kay Yoder, Bob and Dina Rowe, Jerry Odie, Bri Brianna and Talon Mayo, Un and then the unspoken requests, and Gilbert, uh, Ken Gilbertson. We pray, Heavenly Father, that by the power of your hand, that you would reach down and touch these people that we have mentioned. You know each individual need, physical, mental, spiritual, financial, whatever it is, Father God, we know that you are able to take care of that problem as we look to you. We pray, Heavenly Father, for each one of us who sit in these pews, we come in with burdens on our hearts, whether it's family issues, whether it is financial issues, uh, whether it's a job issue, you know, each one of us in these pews comes with a burden. Maybe it's people who are unsaved in our family, Father, and we, we pray for their salvation. We pray, Father, because we know that yours is a glorious place to be on that day, and that's where we want them to be. They, we want them to be there with us, and so we ask for their salvation. We pray, Heavenly Father, for the ministries that we support. And we pray, Heavenly Father, for Hannah's House, the Blessings Exchange, Refuge of Hope, those different places that we serve and we uh, serve people in our communities. We pray for our missionaries. We pray for Tim and Colleen Stevenson and for Caitlin and for others that are around the world. We pray, Father God, that you would minister in their hearts and to the people that they serve. We pray, Heavenly Father, for your name to be lifted up and for you to be glorified. And Father, we just give you praise for all the good things that you are doing. We pray for wisdom about this purchase. We pray, Heavenly Father, that we would be guided by your thoughts and how you want this, this church to go. We, we already recognize that you are doing a great work here and now. It is all you, and we praise you for that. And we pray, Heavenly Father, to be in line with your will and with your way so that we can do the things of God that you want us to do, that you ordained for us to be doing. So we pray for your wisdom. Father, we pray for Pastor Greg and Sherry. We pray that they are having a time that they can relax and enjoy family. But we pray, Heavenly Father, for their safe travels as they come home. We pray, Heavenly Father, for uh, Brother Joe as he comes to break the word to us this morning. We ask that you would anoint him from the top of his head to the bottom of his feet, that he would speak the words that only come from you. And I pray, Father God, that in our hearts, that our eyes of our hearts would be open to receive the word that you have for each one of us. And that as we leave this place, we go with the joy of the Lord in our hearts and salvation on our lips, that we would be the people of God that you have called us to be, rightly representing you in our communities wherever we go. And we will give you all the praise and the glory in your son's powerful and holy name. Amen. Oh, I have to introduce Pastor Joe here. <laughs> um, I'm going to put this down. Brother Joe here. I've known him for a little while. He was in our small group when, we, when they first came. And uh, he, Pastor Greg has already told us that he has written several books, and one of them was about the book of Revelation, so I'm waiting to hear what he has to tell us this morning. Uh, he is a graduate of uh, Gulf Coast uh, Bible College and Anderson, and he has been uh, a pastor in churches in Arkansas, 
in Ohio. <laughs> so I want you to welcome him, and I know that we are all going to hear some good words from him. Thank you, Charlene. I uh, consider it a great privilege to step into this pulpit that is so ably and faithfully filled by our pastor. And as I've been sitting there, I'm, I'm wondering if there's anybody else here this morning who enjoys a good mystery story. I'm not the only one. When I was young, many years ago, uh, there was a series of books about the Hardy Boys mysteries. I see some head shaking. <laughs> but the only mystery books that my mother had were ones that she had read when she was young. So I learned pretty quickly to hide from my buddies the fact that I was reading Nancy Drew. <laughs> But I, I soon graduated to people like uh, Sherlock Holmes and Lieutenant Columbo and people like that. And I learned fairly quickly that in order to solve a mystery, you have to pay close attention to what might seem like tiny details. I learned about plot twists and expecting the unexpected but, you know, I never was really all that gifted at prolonged concentration. So usually I just kind of let the plot unfold and I find that I'm entertained. And that works pretty well when you're reading fiction or when you're watching television. But what about when you're dealing with questions about the mystery of life itself? How did we get here? Who put us here? Why are we here? What are we supposed to do while we're here? Where are we going? And are there any consequences if I miss this? Well, we have the privilege this morning of looking into God's Word together, and I would ask that you stand with me as we turn to Revelation chapter 10 as we stand in reverence for God's Word, and I'm going to be reading verses 1 through 11, the entirety of the chapter. John says, Then I saw another mighty angel coming down from heaven, wrapped in a cloud with a rainbow over his head, and his face was like the sun, and his legs like pillars of fire. He had a little scroll open in his hand, and he set his right foot on the sea and his left foot on the land and called out with a loud voice like a lion roaring. And when he called out, the seven thunders sounded. And when the seven thunders had sounded, I was about to write. But I heard a voice from heaven saying, seal up what the seven thunders have said and do not write it down. And the angel whom I saw standing on the sea and on the land raised his right hand to heaven and swore by him who lives forever and ever, who created heaven and what is in it and the earth and what is in it and the sea and what is in it, that there would be no more delay. But that in the days of the trumpet call, to be sounded by the seventh angel, the mystery of God would be fulfilled, just as he had announced to his servants, the prophets. And then the voice that I had heard from heaven spoke to me again, saying, Go, take the scroll that is in the hand of the angel who is standing on the sea and the land. So I went to the angel and told him to give me the little scroll. And he said to me, take and eat it. It will make your stomach bitter, but in your mouth it will be sweet as honey. And I took the little scroll from the hand of the angel and ate it, and it was sweet as honey in my mouth. But when I had eaten it, my stomach 
was made bitter. And I was told, you must again prophesy about many peoples and nations and languages and kings. Thank you for standing. You may be seated. So my first question this morning is, who is this angel? Which is another way of asking how important is this encounter that we're going to look at today. John calls him mighty, and this is uh, detail number one, if we could have that on the screen. Two other times, John uses the word mighty to refer to an angel. But this one is unique. He's not just one of those other two angels that sort of appears again in the story by chance. This one is clothed in a cloud. And he has a rainbow over his head. And and his face shines like the brilliance of the sun. His legs were like columns of fire as he stood with one on the right on the sea, and the left foot on the land. All these things, all these descriptions are biblical ways of referring to divinity. And so we wouldn't be, it wouldn't be surprising if we wondered, is this in fact Jesus? But no, it's not. Because John merely refers to him as another mighty angel. And he would have never referred to Jesus that way. But his description shows us that this angel, like Jesus, had come from the very presence of God. And with his full blessing on this message. Now, I I want you to notice something this morning that I think is very interesting. If we can have the, the first few verses of Revelation 1 on the screen. As this book opens, it is described as the revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave him to show his servants what must soon take place. And he made it known by sending his angel to his servant John who bore witness. And it goes on to say that uh, blessed is the one who reads aloud the words of this prophecy, and blessed are those who hear. Now, I had one disappointment when I got here this morning. If you can put the, uh, the next screen of the, uh, the chain up for me. I had brought with me a pointer And I was really proud when I got the thing. I was walking around everywhere, making sure it reflected well off the walls and the ceiling and the carpet until I pointed it at a television. (laughs) And it doesn't work. (laughs) So just uh, bear with me as I try to point out for you, starting at the lower left, as we look at these links in the chain. I call this Revelation's chain of transmission. God the Father gave this message to God the Son, who gave it to this angel, who then brought it to John. And John bore witness by delivering this message to what the Bible calls the angels of the the churches, the seven churches. And since the word angel means messenger, I think in this context, we are probably right to think that he was giving it to the pastors of these churches. And they then would read them aloud to their own worshipers as they gathered together on Sunday morning. And over the years between then and now, there have been countless other believers who have read these words and copied these words and translated these words so that you and I can have the privilege of reading them today. Now, you notice, though, that there's a gap between the eighth and ninth links of the chain. Why is that? 
because as you and I come to understand the meaning of this message, we have the privilege of asking ourselves, with whom will I share it? Because we are given by God the the privilege and, in fact, the responsibility of sharing the message of God's word with those who are around us. Now, if you've studied this message at all, you probably already know, if we can have the next screen uh, about the different form of the scroll, you probably already know that John uses a different form of the word scroll here in this chapter than he did back in chapter 5 when he saw it in the Father's hand. And there are some people who put so much stress on the idea that this is a diminutive form of the word here. That's why it's often translated little scroll. But it doesn't seem that John is really intending to put any kind of emphasis on that fact. Because in verse 8, he uses the very same word that he used back in chapter 5. So there's not really any any compelling reason to think that these scrolls are different. I believe that this very scroll that he sees in the angel's hand is the one whose seals Jesus had been given the authority to break open. And sometime after that seventh seal was broken, Jesus placed this now open, now readable scroll in the hands of this angel, and he sent him on his way to John. And now you and I this morning have the privilege of seeing its contents and being able to explain it to those around us. And I have, like Charlene kind of referred to a little bit, I've been studying this book for decades and decades. Yeah, I'm, I'm an old guy. <laughs> Um, And although I, I still learn something new all the time, one of the things that I have become convinced about was that um, what we're seeing here is not primarily futuristic predictions, which are speculative. But what we're seeing here is an expression of the divine purpose for our lives and for this world, which really has to do with our transformation. Pastor Greg wanted to make sure I got that word in there because he's right. Revelation, just like all the rest of the New Testament, is about the believer's transformation. But first, there's something else in this passage that has caused a, a great deal of speculation, if you will. If we can have detail number three on the screen. When this angel roared like a lion, there were seven rumbles or claps of thunder. And just like he had done when, uh, when he heard the message of the, the seals and again with the trumpets, John was about to write down what these seven thunders had said. But he was told to put down his pen and seal up or hide away what the thunders had said. Why? Why would God instruct them like that? There's a British theologian whose name is Richard Baucom, and and he makes a point that, that I think is quite appropriate here. If you remember back in chapter 6, when we saw the breaking of the seals, we were told that they brought about the death of one quarter of the earth's population. And then if you remember back in chapters 8 and 9, when we looked at the seven trumpets, or at least the first six of them, we were told that um, they brought devastation to a third of the creation. So Baucom says it's reasonable to presume here that the seven thunders would have affected half of the globe 
as these, as these percentages begin to get higher and higher. And since the seals and the trumpets were God's judgment against sin, which did not produce the intended effect, as Pastor Greg shared so beautifully last week, the intended effect from God was to bring about repentance, to bring about change of behavior. After the seven seals, or, or again, the first six, you may remember that instead of turning to God, people hid themselves from him. And then with the trumpets, the same thing happened. After the first six of them had been blown, um, people still refused to grieve over or turn away from their behavior. The fact of the matter is, people just want to keep on doing what they've always done. They don't want to be confronted by a God who would correct or challenge them. We probably know people like that, don't we? One of the things that this passage tells us, if we could have detail four on the screen, it indicates that God does not bring judgment because he enjoys it. He does not bring judgment because he gets some, some kind of pleasure out of other people's pain, but rather so that we will change and enjoy genuine life. That's exactly what he said uh, to Ezekiel. He said, I get no pleasure when the wicked die, but rather when they change their ways and live. Jesus said that judgment is revealed when the light comes into the world and yet people enjoy the darkness more than the light. God said to Isaiah, they have chosen their own ways and they delight in their abominations. Therefore, I also will choose harsh treatment for them. For they did evil in my sight and chose what displeases me. Similarly, he said through Jeremiah, your actions, your own conduct have brought this upon you, as he was referring to the destruction of, of Jerusalem. And yet Paul tells us that God actually desires everyone to be saved and to come to know the truth. And that's why Jesus said, that the Father sent him not to condemn the world, but to save it. One reason that judgment alone might not produce repentance is because it doesn't bring good news, if we can have uh, detail number five. Judgment alone does not re uh, produce repentance because it doesn't bring anything to be happy about, to be excited about. Think about when you were disciplined by your parents. Did it stop you? Did it change you? Or did it simply make you more skilled at covering your tracks? But you know, when children are assured of parental love in that context, that's when real change can take place. And for the same reason, we're told that God disciplines us. See, it's only when we understand the good news that resides within judgment that repentance and faith can occur. We see the, the signals about this mystery all over the book of Revelation. Why do you think there are 24 elders? Because the 12 tribes of Israel and the 12 apostles of Jesus have been joined together in one universal family. And we're told exactly that later in the book when John sees that city coming down from heaven. We're told that it had a great high wall with 12 gates. And on those gates the names of the 12 tribes of the sons of Israel were inscribed. 
But it also says that the wall, the wall of the city had 12 foundations, and on them were the 12 names of the 12 apostles of the Lamb. And then again, Jesus is praised repeatedly in Revelation because he ransomed people for God from every language and tribe and, and people and nation. And then referring back again to that city that we're shown at the, end of, uh, at the end of the book, when it comes down from heaven, we're told that the nations will walk within it. And in, the, and in the new Jerusalem, the earth's kings will bring their glory into it. You see, notwithstanding any of the kind of barriers that we have built up among one another, whether it be Republican or Democrat or Caucasians or Arabs or uh, Palestinians or Israelis or corporate executives or or assembly line workers, Jesus has made his people one, and he's commissioned us to love and serve other people. God's mystery is not only involving our unity, but also telling us about our strategy for dealing with those around us. And even though I believe that that point lies at the very heart of Revelation's message, I still can't find a better, uh, a better example of, of putting it into words than Paul's description of Jesus in Philippians chapter 2. Let me paraphrase that for you. Don't get swallowed up by your own interests, but look out for the needs of others. Have this attitude in you that was also in Christ Jesus when he refused to cling to his privileges but rather emptied himself to become a servant and humbled himself to endure a shameful and painful death. And it's for that very reason that God honored and exalted him in the most glorious way possible. That's why the message of this scroll produces a honey-like sweetness in John's mouth. You want to know the best news I've ever heard? You already know it. (laughs) The best news I've ever heard is that God cared enough not to leave me to my own devices or in my own dilemma, but to come looking for me in Jesus and to enable me by his spirit to say yes to him, even though I had spent a lot of years running from him. You want to know what the sweetest thing is that's imaginable? Years ago, I was a youth minister, and one of the mothers asked me uh, to pay a visit to her wayward son. The first time I met him, he was facing criminal charges. He and a friend had, had broken into a store and robbed it. And the second time I met him, uh, he was in a juvenile detention facility where he was waiting to be transferred to jail. And I shared the gospel there, and when I left, I gave him a little pocket copy of the gospel, or the, the gospel of John. Eight or ten years later or so, I was in Anderson, Indiana, uh, for what used to be called camp meeting, and this fellow walks up to me and says, you don't remember me, do you? I didn't recognize him. But he told me that he had read that Gospel of John while he was in jail and put his trust in Jesus. And he also said that at that time, this is years ago now, he was in college studying for the pastoral ministry. (laughs) Friends, if, if you've ever had anything to do with introducing somebody to Jesus, you know exactly how sweet that is. 
But you know, John also describes the bitterness in his stomach after he swallowed that scroll. Its sweet taste also produces bitterness because people really do reject their only hope. People really do remain separated from God, from the one who is light and life and grace. We don't understand that until we come to Christ. And its sweet taste also produces bitterness because there really are cases when God's people are ridiculed or alienated or persecuted or even killed, as we've just seen uh, in, in the past few days with the, uh, the missionary couple. That's why revel Revelation is often seen as a dark and gruesome book because it pulls no punches about the world's ugly and desperate situation. And it doesn't pull any punches about the depths of suffering which God's witnesses are sometimes called on to endure. That's also part of the mystery of this gospel. That's why the angel told John, you must prophesy again about many kings and peoples and nations and languages. You see, this message of, of this mystery is for everyone, even you. The one thing that Greg and I never want to do is to talk about this book matter-of-factly so that you might mistake it for a textbook. No, we want you to see Jesus here. And we pray that God will enable you to see yourself here. If you're a person who looks into this book and sees separation between you and God, or, or if you're a person who really does not know what it means to have a sure and certain hope. If you're a person for whom words like light and life and grace are just words rather than a deep personal reality, the Lord wants to transform that in you today. On the other hand, if you're a person who looks into this book and sees the Lamb who means more to you than life itself, but also makes you realize that uh, you, you need help in being able to give of yourself and sacrifice yourself for the well-being of someone else. As we conclude this morning, I'm going to ask that you would stand with me and uh, as Pastor Greg always says, uh, if you would like to meet with the Lord this morning, uh, if you'd like to pray and have someone come pray with you, um, we would ask that you would do so at the altar to my right. If you'd like to pray privately and by yourself, you may do so at the altar to my left. We in the Church of God have always uh, had a, a, a prominent place for altars. Because even though this is not the only place you can meet with God, it's a very significant and even convenient place for you to do so. So as we conclude this morning, uh, if you need to pray, please come.
I don't know about you, but I'm thankful for God's word that just changes us from the inside and how, you know, in this series of Revelation, it's just speaking to us right now and how we can take it today and it changes our lives as we continue to live as he calls us to. Um, as we have those around us still praying, uh, we're going to dismiss um, is there an anointing we need to do together? Each of us can just reach out our hands and, um, you know, pray over him as we anoint him together.
go in his peace.